becoming a curse for us. That's Galatians, the third chapter, verse number 13. And the song says, I am redeemed, bought with a price. Jesus has changed my whole life. And if anybody asks you just who I am, tell them that I've been redeemed. I am redeemed. Father God, for blessing us and redeeming us. God, we thank you, Father God, for who you are, for what you do. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us and keeping us. We thank you for another visit to the house of prayer. We ask you, Father God, to bless us, to be saturated with your word, that your word will be clear, your word will be relevant, and your word, Father God, will do those things that you have said it would do. God, you said your word will not go out and return unto you, Lord. We pray, Father God, that you touch our hearts, our minds, and our souls, that we will glorify you and honor you as we are redeemed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Uh -huh. 
talking about sharing the gospel on tonight. Got a nice book in my hand that was was written back in the 1900s, 1998. It's called Sharing the Gospel. This is the workbook. This is the workbook, Sharing the Gospel. If you need a copy, you can get it for a small amount of money. See me after church, you can get it for a small amount of money. We're looking forward to Sharing the Gospel, Good News on the Go coming out maybe in March or April, amen? So this is the workbook. We're looking forward to the manual coming out in March or April. Tonight we look at the five P's to effective evangelism. Five P's to effective evangelism. What is evangelism? Some have said that evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Evangelism, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. What does that say to us? When we talk about evangelism, when we think about evangelism, what is that saying? We talk about evangelism, we're talking about reaching souls for Christ. Anybody else has another definition of evangelism? What is evangelism? Spreading the good news. Good news is I got a brand new car. Is that the good news? Good news of Jesus Christ. Spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. So evangelism is spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody online? Anybody? What is evangelism? What do you think about when you hear the word evangelism? One person's moving, two persons are moving, no one speaking. Sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel. Anybody else? Uh, and, uh, asking someone or trying to get them to make a change. Trying to get someone to make a change. Change for, for, good. for good. Evangelism. Mm -hmm. Encouraging someone to make a change for good. Is it spiritual? Is it emotional? Is it Moral? Mainly spiritual. But spiritual. Really we're asking someone to make a change spiritually. So we're witnessing to them to make a change spiritually. Okay, anybody else? Evangelism. Over the years, I've looked at this thing called evangelism, and I've come up with the five P's to effective evangelism. Five P's, five P's, five P's to effective evangelism. What are those five P's, Sister Carolyn Davis? What are those five P's? Prepare. Prepare. Pinpoint. Pinpoint. Punctuate. You guessing. <laughs> Look at the paper in front of you. <laughs> don't don't mess us up. I mean, you got the paper. Read the paper. Okay. They say if you want to hide something from some people, just put it on paper. <laughs> I mean, the paper within two inches. Read that paper. Let's talk about the five P's of effective evangelism. Sister Davis, what are the five P's to effective evangelism? Prepare. Prepare. Pinpoint. Pinpoint. Personalize. Personalize. Picturize. Picturize. Prescribe. And prescribe. The five P's of effective evangelism, and we emphasize the word effective evangelism. The five P's to effective evangelism are prepare, pinpoint, personalize, picturize, and prescribe. By the end of this series, I want you to have that in your spirit. Prepare, pinpoint, personalize, picturize, and prescribe. I got it in my spirit. Can you have it in yours before the night is over? The five P's to effective evangelism. Prepare, pinpoint, personalize, picturize, and prescribe. We want, to, we want that to be embedded and deep down, planted deep down in our hearts. There are five P's to effective evangelism. And these five P's enables us 
to verbally communicate the word of God. We want to verbally communicate the word of God. Verbally communicate the word of God. I have three main scriptures that we will follow during this series. Second Chronicles 16 and 9. Acts 1 and 8. First Peter 3 15. So during this during this uh, series, we want to follow these three scriptures. Second Chronicles 16 and 9. Or 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. Second Chronicles 16 and 9. Acts 1 and 8. Acts 1 and 8. First Peter 3.15 or 1 Peter 3.15. So we will look at those. If each of you would take one of those verses each, uh, Brother Miles, will you take Second Chronicles 16 and 9? Sister Woods, will you take um, Acts 1 and 8? And Sister Brown, will you take First Peter 3.15? 1 Peter 3.15. We want to look at these verses because they're going to lay the foundation, the groundwork for evangelism. 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. Who has that one? Will you stand and read for us real big? 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Okay. We're concerned with the A portion. Will you stand and read the A portion for us one more again? Second Chronicles 16 and 9. We're concerned about the A portion of that verse. Second Chronicles 16 and 9. Yes, sir. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Amen. Amen. So the eyes of the Lord. Whose eyes? The Lord's, the Lord's eyes. Whose eyes? The, the Lord's eyes are running where? Mm -hmm. To and fro. Back and forward. Forward and back. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro. Throughout how much of the earth? The whole earth. The eyes of the Lord is running to and fro throughout the whole earth to do what? Show to show himself mighty through who? Those whose hearts are turned toward him. Boy, that's awesome to me. This really pumps me up in Bible study. When I hear the eyes of the Lord, not man eyes, not women eyes, not children eyes, but the eyes of the Lord are running back and forth, to and fro, looking for somebody. Checking the world out for somebody. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for somebody that he can show himself mighty through. The idea is that God will be shown mighty. God is looking for somebody whose hearts are turned toward him. That he can show himself mighty through you. Now the question becomes. Can God show himself mighty through you? <laughs> Is God showing himself to be mighty through you? Or are you mighty and you left God out? Are you showing yourself to be mighty? With God's resources. God is looking. Throughout the whole earth, throughout the whole world, looking for somebody that he can show himself mighty through. God wants you. He wants to use you. He wants to bless you. And he wants to show himself mighty through you. God wants to utilize us. God wants to, to bless us so we can be a blessing to other people. God wants to use us to evangelize. And in the process of us evangelizing, verbally, socially, morally, God is seen as the mighty God. The question remains, is God using you to show himself mighty? 
Or are you using God so you can be mighty? Are you showing yourself mighty in order for you to get a pat on the back? God's eyes are running back and forth, to and fro, not through a fourth of the earth, but throughout the whole earth. God sees everything. Remember that word I made up? He's omnivisual. Somebody probably patented it by now. It's been almost a year now, so now I get it. God is omnivisual. He sees everything. And then this verse is going to come along and say his eyes are not just staying fixed. His eyes are running back and forth, to and fro, throughout the whole earth, so he can show himself mighty through you. God wants to utilize us to bless others. Acts 1 and 8. Who has Acts 1 and 8? Acts 1 and 8. Acts 1 and 8. Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jesus speaking. Acts 1 and 8 is a great evangelistic verse. What does it say? Acts 1 and 8 says, somebody? You shall power. Acts 1 and 8 says, you will receive power. This word power is dunamis or dunamis. Dunamis power is explosive power. It's the same power that dynamite carries. It's dynamite power. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro, looking for somebody that he can show himself powerful through. And you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has gone upon you. And you will be witnesses. It didn't say after the Holy Ghost come upon you, you will roll on the floor. Help me. It didn't say after the Holy Ghost come upon you, you will jump and shout. Anybody in this house? After the Holy Ghost come upon you, you will lay hands on the sick. Not in this verse. It says after the Holy Ghost come upon you, you shall receive power. And when you receive the power of the Holy Ghost, guess what happens? You will be a witness unto God. You will witness. You'll be a testimony. You'll tell somebody about God's goodness. You will evangelize. The problem is that we have the Holy Ghost. We have him present. The Holy Ghost, he is present. The Holy Ghost is present. But what are we doing? The Holy Ghost is present. There's an engine under the hood of your car. And some of you don't use it. I use mine. You'll get that when you go home. My daughter and my wife tells me, don't treat my car like that. Well, it has an engine. And it has a speedometer on it. The car will go as fast as the phenomenon says. If it doesn't, you need to take it back. <laughs> I did not say you need to check it out and get to the, the, the level that the phenomenon stops. What I am saying is, when I accelerate, accelerate both of them stuff, I don't treat my car like that. It's a car. It was made to accelerate. It has power. It has dunamis power. It has dynamite power. You don't believe me when you go inside an engine, you see spark plugs on the side of it. And if you were to take a camera on the inside, you would see combustion taking place. Explosions taking place. And every now and then, I like to feel that explosion take place. What did I just say, Brother Miles? <laughs> Every now and then, you ought to see if the explosion can take place. Yeah. 
Every now and then, the dunamis power that God has given us, you need to make sure you put into work. Every now and then, the whole, when the Holy Ghost, you talk about how the Holy Ghost is present, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Jesus says, when the Holy Ghost come upon you, you shall receive power. You will feel the explosion. And that explosion makes you witness. And check this out. In the car, if I turn the engine off and hit the accelerator, it does nothing. Same way it is with the Holy Spirit. Or the Holy Ghost. If you don't let him have his way, you just shut the engine off. There's no combustion taking place. There's no explosion taking place. And there are no souls saved. We were placed on planet Earth and saved and born again so that we can lead people to Christ. We are here to evangelize. You're not saved just so you can go to heaven. You are here to evangelize. You are here to win souls for Jesus Christ. You are here to make sure that men, women, boys, and girls fall out with their evil ways. You are here so people will stop shooting people in road road rages. And the only way to do it is to get them to Jesus. I talk again. I, I say again. I've said it for the last two Sundays. Let me say it on Wednesday night. Woman is approached by a man. He asks her, "Do you have to know Jesus? Do you have? Do you need Jesus to go to heaven?" So, man, you need Jesus to pump gas. You need Jesus to go to Walmart. You need Jesus just to walk down the street. So, certainly, you need Jesus to go to heaven. How many people don't need Jesus at all? I got this. I was walking in the store a day later, walking out. She had on her shirt. God got this. But just because God got it doesn't mean that you turn the engine off. Every now and then, you got to feel the power. Every now and then, you have to be a part of the demonstration of the power. Every now and then, you got to ask somebody, do you know Jesus? How can I pray for you? Lead into a conversation. In the midst of a conversation, lead the conversation in a spiritual way. Have you ever heard of the four spiritual laws? Have you ever heard of the Roman road? How many people know what my business card looks like? I mean, you've got used to it. You've seen it in your, your church up front. What's on the back? The Roman road, right? So every mean we can come up with ought to have an opportunity for us to lead people to Jesus Christ. We ought, to, we ought to position ourselves. We ought to posture ourselves that we can lead people to Christ. We must evangelize. We must tell them about Jesus. How are we going to fill the church up? We're going to tell people about Jesus. When they get to church, what are they going to hear? They're going to hear about Jesus. You all do know that there's a great gulf in the generation gap from the 20th century to the 21st century, right? In the 20th, in the 20th century, children kind of respected parents, right? In the 21st century, parents better sit down somewhere and be quiet. It's because we have not evangelized even in our home. Our children need to know Jesus. Our cousins need to know Jesus. Our drunk uncles need to know Jesus. Ain't he that runs everything need to know Jesus. Even big mama and him need to know Jesus. So we need to evangelize. We need to tell people about Jesus. Remember this, and you may want to write this down because this is going to be on the test. Don't look at me in that tone of voice, sister. It's going to be all right. I don't want to stop y'all from coming to Bible study, but write, write this down. Everybody needs to know Jesus, right? Sin has left us in a bad way. 
Sin has left us in a bad way. And only Jesus can fix it. Sin has left us in a bad way. And only Jesus can fix it. How has sin left us? In a bad way. And who's going to fix it? Only Jesus can fix it. If we partnered with the pastor to get people saved, we would be doing great things. If we would just partner with the pastor to get people saved, we would do, be doing a great thing. If we would have more meetings about how we're going to reach the world for Christ, we would, we would be doing a great thing. If we would just come to the conclusion that people need to know Jesus more than they need to pop it and lock it. Drop it and lock it. <laughs> we have children in middle schools that's in gym class learning how to shoot an AR-15 or AR-45 or whatever. So they're training them. Middle school. What's the age of middle school? 11, 12, 13? In middle school, they are teaching children and they show a video and a, and a picture of them lying on the floor with a, with a long gun shooting a target on the other side of the room. They are teaching them how to shoot a gun. We need to be teaching children about Jesus. We need to teach our neighbors about Jesus. We have to evangelize. And the whole thing about behind one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread, it is that I'm not perfect. And because I'm not perfect, I need to get you to Jesus. Because I'm not any better than you are, I need to show you where I got blessed. Because I've been where you are, unsaved. I need to introduce you to Jesus. But now when we come across like we got it made, we've always had it made, we just step, step down out of the clouds and we don't have any problems, then we got problems. <laughs> I mean, you know you got problems. When you come to the conclusion that you're more than who you are and more than what you are, you have serious, serious, serious problems. And your problems are long-term problems. Mm -hmm. These are real problems. You think you got a problem when you have a belly ache, a stump toe? If you don't know Jesus, you got a real problem. And then if you do know Jesus and think you more than anybody else, you got a serious problem. Because it took Jesus to save you. Mm -hmm. The problem is, we don't want to long suffer with people the way God long suffered with us. We need to know Jesus. And once we get to know him, we need to renew our relationship and our fellowship with him every single day. The seasoned saints back home said, Jesus gets better wrong by wrong and round by round. They talk about climbing this ladder to heaven in a even if I'm going up the rough side of the mountain with Jesus, it gets sweeter and sweeter every day. I mean, you can attest like I did. I stayed out there too long. <laughs> then I wasted a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of sleep. When I should have just been getting closer and closer to Jesus. Some people are not so Holy Ghost filled because they got to know Jesus in a real way. Some of us just got too old to do it. Some of us didn't stop doing what we used to do because we just got so filled with the Holy Ghost and so on fire for God. What does it look like me trying to do what I used to do? 
60 year old man. I'm closer to 60 than I am to 50. I'm closer to 60 than I am to 59. And I'm closer to 60 than I, than I, and I'm out there trying to do what I did when I was 17. But we ought to be so empowered by the Holy Ghost until we ought to be on fire to witness for Jesus Christ. We ought to love sharing the gospel. You ought to look for an opportunity to share Jesus Christ. You ought to pray for it. When Sharpstown Mall was Sharpstown Mall, I used to go to Sharpstown Mall and stand on the top floor and look down on the people. And I would say, Lord, send somebody my way that I can share Christ with. And every single time I did that, somebody came my way and I was able to share Jesus Christ. One incident, there was a little boy who looks like he was like 16 years old. He was walking in the mall. This is when teenagers could walk anywhere and don't be fearful. This is in the 80s. Little boy was coming and he was licking on his ice cream cone, licking on his ice cream. I said, man, give me some of that. No, I didn't want any of his ice cream. But I had to find a way to get in. I had just prayed, Lord, send somebody my way that I can share Jesus Christ with. What comes with the ice cream cone? I didn't expect him to give me any. I didn't expect him to even stop unless the Lord stopped him. I said, man, give me some of that ice cream. He looks at me, and that was long enough for me to stop. I knew the Lord had stopped. He looks at me and said, man, and he engaged me. I got him down, Sister Brown. He said, man, I ain't giving you no of my ice cream. I said, well, can I talk to you about Jesus? He stopped long enough for me to shift gears on him. He, shot, he stopped long enough for the combustion to take place. He stopped long enough for me to start up my end. When he stopped just to say, man, I ain't giving you none of my ice cream, that was good enough for me. Well, let me just talk to you for a minute. And usually when you ask God to do it, he'll do it. And whenever God does it, he prepares the ground before the person meets you and before you meet the person. This boy and I ended up sitting on the bench in Sharpstown Mall on the second floor. He eating his ice cream and I'm sharing God's truth with him. I'm sharing the salvation story. I'm sharing how Jesus voluntarily gave his life for him. That's the first time I ever met that boy, and it was the last time I ever saw him. I didn't care about his name. I didn't care about what church he went to. I just wanted to share Jesus Christ. I shared Jesus Christ with this boy. He bowed his head right there on the second floor of Sharpstown Mall. He invited Jesus Christ in his life. And while we were sitting there and we were praying and he was repeating after me, then a lady walks up and said, y'all were actually praying in the mall. And guess what? She stopped long enough for the convulsion to take place. And I prayed that God send me one, and God sent two. So I, I said goodbye to that young man and started talking to this woman. Guess what I talked to her about? Jesus. The same thing that fit a young African-American boy fit a senior Anglo woman. He's not a God of color. Don't spend your time arguing about what color Jesus was. Well, does it matter? At the age of nine, I fell in a lake. If you heard the story before, act like you never heard it. I fell in a lake, age of nine. I, I went on the water three times, and then I went on a fourth time. And every time I tried to swim my way out, the vines would wrap around my, my leg. And I could see my mom, we were fishing. And I could see my mom up there on the bank just running to and fro, begging somebody to help me out the water. There was a black guy there, and he had been drinking a little bit. He was feeling really good. And he started cussing, leave that blank, blank, blank in there. He shouldn't have gone out there on that rock anyway. He should have known that rock wasn't going to hold him. And we were just fishing. 
That rock started sliding. I went under. I tried to walk out. It was too deep. I tried to swim out. Vines just kept wrapping around my leg. I took one step, stand up on one rock, and that rock goes on. All this was playing out in front of my brothers and my little sister and, and my mama. We, they, I could see my mom just running back and forth. And this guy was screaming and hollering, saying, said, leave him in there. Leave him in there. He shouldn't have gone out there. This black guy. And there was only one white guy out there. By right now, I'm, I'm concerned because dad told me if I ever break my glasses again, or I ever lose my glasses again, it was going to be like mayhem. So I finally, finally stood up on a rock, and this, this white guy came up, and he said, uh, stand on that rock right there, son. I, he said, that rock is not going to move. Just trust me. I stood on that rock. And the moment I stood on that rock, I pulled my glasses off and said, here, mama. She said, boy, put those glasses down. I ain't stuck those glasses. <laughs> so this white guy says, look, I'm going to hand you this fishing pole. I said, but the weeds are still wrapped around my leg. He said, I'm going to hand you the fishing pole. And when you grab the end of this pole, lay down, and the vine will just slip off your leg. Because I was fighting the vines. <laughs> but he said, just lay down. Just relax. And I'm going to pull you out the water. I laid down. I came off that rock. And he just pulled me right out the water. And you asked me today, did I care whether it was a black man or a white man? I just know that the man on the other end of the pole saved my life. That's how it is with Jesus. <laughs> Don't even get into the conversation. I mean, it's good history. It's, it's good to know. But when it comes to Jesus, people need to know who he is more than what color he is. We need to know Jesus. Because that was a prime demonstration that sometimes your color won't help you out. Matter of fact, sometimes your color will kick you back in. <laughs> So as whoever Jesus sent, bless me, Lord. Any way you want to, Lord, bless me. Acts 1 and 8 says that, that you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses unto him. You will be witnesses. Who has 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter 3 and 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Amen. Set aside God in your heart. Make sure you put God somewhere that no one else can be. He's not the man upstairs. He's not the big boss. I heard a preacher one time preach the sermon, the big boss man. He's not the big boss man. He's not the man upstairs. He's not my big buddy. He's God. Sanctify him. Set, set him apart. Deem him as holy. Deem him as different. He's God. And what the rest of that verse say? Sanctify him and be ready. Be always ready. Be always ready to do what? Give an answer of the hope that lies within you. What hope lies with me? Jesus is the only Savior of the world. The same Jesus that died on Calvary, the same Jesus that rose from the dead, he saved me. And it's that same Jesus going to take me from earth to glory. Be ready. It doesn't matter where you are, always be ready. When we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, it says right around verse 3, he says, and he died for our sins. Who did? Jesus did. 
When you begin at verse number one, Paul says, this is the gospel. The same word that I spoke to you and the same word that saved me is the same word that saved you. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. And he says, continue to believe this gospel unless you believe in vain. Verse three, he says, Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. What else does it say? He was buried. Then it says he rose the third day according to the scripture. Then he says, and he was seen first by Cephas. Then he was seen by the twelve. And when you run around all the way to verse number nine, it says, and he was seen by over 500 men at one time. Write this down. Good test question. First Corinthians 15, verses one through nine. One through five and one through nine. First Corinthians 15, verses one through nine. And then Paul says, and then finally he was seen by me, an apostle out of due season. Okay? First of all, write the word gospel. G-O-S-P-E-L. G-O-S-P-E-L. Now write this. G-O, capital G-O. Then move over space and write S-P-E-L-L. -L. We're talking about gospel, right? So when you add the L to the end, what do you have? Go spell. It is our responsibility to go spell the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go spell out to other men the good news of Jesus Christ. Where is the good news found? First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 9, you will find, first of all, what makes up the gospel. There are, there are four things that make up the gospel. There are four pillars that make up the gospel. First one is found in verse number three. And then you can tell me what the rest of them are found. Verse number three. What does verse number three say? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse three. Sister Derrick, what does verse, verse three say? First Corinthians chapter 15, verse number three. It says, Jesus died according to the scripture, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 3, that Jesus died. So the first pillar that holds up the good news, the gospel, is Jesus died. The second pillar, where is it found? Within the first five verses. What's the second pillar? What does verse 4 say? He was buried. So the second pillar is the fact that Jesus was buried. Jesus was buried. Jesus, who was buried? Jesus was buried. The third pillar, where is it found? Verse number four, what does it say? Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus rose. Jesus rose. Jesus rose. So we're talking about telling people of the hope that lies within us. Telling people what's in us. First thing, Jesus died according to the scripture. Second thing, Jesus was buried. He was buried in Joseph's brand new tomb. The third thing, Jesus rose from the dead according to the scripture. And the fourth thing is, Jesus was seen. Some text says he, he appeared. Jesus was seen. So, two o'clock in the morning, I wake you up, ring your phone, don't hang up, don't put it, take it off the hook and leave it off the hook. If I ring your phone at two o'clock in the morning, I tell you to, I need you to describe the gospel. What you gonna tell me? Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose, and Jesus was seen. 
And the fact that he was seen is the evidence. The fact that he was seen is evidence so men can know that what he spoke was real and what he spoke was true. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's what we ought to be teaching. That's what we ought to preach. That's what we ought to witness for. <laughs> the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you present the gospel or the gospel or the good news, you ain't got time to gossip. You don't have time to lie. Because you're going to be ready at all times to give the reason why you believe. At any given moment, you want to be ready to give an answer to whoever asks you of what, what did you say, Sister Brown? Ask you of the hope that lies within you. And if we're going to heaven, we got to believe this story. If we're going to see Jesus, we got to believe this story. The problem is we worried about who we're going to see when we get to heaven. Just see Jesus. Because there are no relationships as we know them in heaven. You do know that, right? I mean, people shout all over the place. When I get to heaven, I'm going to see you again. Forget about that. Just see Jesus. If I can make it to see Jesus. Every tub must sit on his own bottom. Right? Every tub must sit on its own bottom. You need to see Jesus for yourself. My, my granddaddy was the chairman of deacon, and boy, he could call on the Lord. That's when they got on their knees and prayed in church. My cousin that just passed away, he became the chairman of deacon when my granddaddy died. Now my cousin, who's the son of the cousin that just passed away, he's, in, he's, he's a deacon. None of that is going to get me to heaven. The only thing that's going to get us to heaven is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go and tell what God has done through Jesus Christ. In other words, we got to be prepared. We got to be ready at any given moment to give an answer to the hope that lies within us. Jesus. I can tell stories all day about my dad, but he can't get me to heaven. I can talk about all day how we grew up and that's only just to hook you in. But it's Jesus that's going to get me to heaven. Amen. We got to talk more about Jesus. We got to tell people more about Jesus. You know, sometimes the Sunday school lessons are so far off. The commentaries in the Sunday school lessons are so far off. Am I right, Brother Miles? Yes, sir. I mean, they're so far off, you'd be wanting to throw a red challenge flag. <laughs> And I'm saying, how do you get that out of that scripture? <laughs> but if they focus on Jesus, and I know some of you get so disturbed when the Sunday school teachers uh, skip over that, 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 little, that little story at the beginning. Like, I prepared all night to hear that story. Well, you read it at home. Why you got to hear it again? It's a privilege. It's an honor when the teacher goes that route. But when they are short on time, you, you see, they don't skip scripture. If they did, they wouldn't be here, right? It's the word of God that changed people. It's the word of God that changed hearts. So we have to be ready to give an answer. So who wants the three o'clock call tonight? One thing that, that, that uh, Hillary Clinton said about President Obama that we need a president that that we can call 3 o'clock in the morning and he can answer the phone and make a good decision. I say that about Christians. <laughs> I ought to be able to call you at 3 o'clock in the morning when you just sleep, snowing, and slog. Say, so tell me about the gospel. And you need to wake up and say, Jesus died according to the scripture. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose according to the scripture. And Jesus was seen first by Cephas, then by the twelve, then by over 5,000 men at one time, and finally by Paul, me, Paul, a, a apostle out of Ducey. 
You say good night, Pastor Aiden. <sighs> Go on back to sleep. Who can I try that with tonight? Anybody? I'm afraid you may speak in tongues on me. And it won't be Holy Ghost tongues either. So we have to get to a point in our lives where we share Jesus Christ. That's why every single time we teach, every single time we preach, we want people to hear Jesus more than hearing us. There was a preacher that really treated his wife badly. He, he treated his wife badly. He talked bad to her at home. But when they went to church, she would just say amen. When he got to preaching, he was, she would say amen. She would shout. So one day, one of the children said, Mama, the way Daddy talked to you at home, why, why do you go to church and shout off his words? And she said, well, I'm not shouting off his words. I'm shouting off God's words. And God is just using him as a vessel. What it says to all of us is all of us are vessels that need to be filled by God. Matter of fact, all of us are messed up vessels. We get upset with the preacher when he does crazy stuff, but all of us got something with us that's not good about us. Therefore, we would need to focus on God's word. Final, final story for the night, and I'll leave you alone. We, we got into gospel. We're going to talk about the five Ps sometime in this series. Okay. A lady came to the church, and she started complaining about how many hypocrites were in the church. And, of course, they want the pastor to hear this. So she goes to the pastor. She started complaining about so many hypocrites at the church. He says, sister, i tell you what. I want you to go around there and get a cup of water. Fill it all the way to the rim. And I want you to take this cup of water and walk all the way around this church without spilling a drop. So okay. I don't know what that got to do with these hypocrites you got here, but I do it. So she took her time. She walked all the way around the building and did not spill a drop of water. And when she got back, she approached the pastor and said, here's your cup of water. He said, I don't see any running down the side. She said, I didn't spill a drop. Is there not any in the grass? She said, I didn't spill a drop. He said, well, did you see any hypocrites down there? She said, she said I didn't have time to look for other folk. I was trying to concentrate on this water. He said, that's my whole point. If you spend time concentrating on Jesus, you won't have time to concentrate on the hypocrites. Because we got hypocrites at Kroger's, we got hypocrites at Foodorama, we got hypocrites at, 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 the, at the cleaners, we got hypocrites at ball game. But it's only at church that we, we criticize the hypocrites. If we concentrate on Jesus, then we can share Christ with others. Always be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you. Always be ready to tell somebody about Jesus. Matter of fact, be ready to change and turn the conversation away from what's being talked about and talk about Jesus. And you don't have to be a preacher to witness to Jesus. You know why? Because it's so simple. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, ch chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. And what do we see there? Jesus died according to the scripture. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose according to the scripture. And Jesus was seen. And that's, your, that's the end of your story. That's the end. Just tell them the story. It's not our story. It's his story that changes lives. The door of the church is open. Invitation is extended. And this is the moment that we witness and we call men, women, boys, and girls to Christ. Will you trust him today? Will you trust Jesus? Will you trust the fact that Jesus died for your sins, buried in a barber tomb, and rose from the dead? If you just trust him today, you can be saved. You can be born again. You can go to heaven when you die. If you never received Christ as your Savior, just repeat these words after me. 
Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you were seen by over 500 men. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and thank God. We believe that now that you receive Christ as your Savior, you're born again. And whenever you leave here, you're on your way to heaven. Go and tell somebody else about the goodness of Jesus Christ. When we thank God for who he is and what he's already done, we thank God for, for blessing us with Jesus. We need to tell people about Jesus. Just tell them about Jesus. Don't give them your opinion. Just tell them about Jesus. And that Jesus saves souls. And he saves souls all by himself. In our prayer time, we want to lift up Brother Whitlock. We want to lift up Brother Kevin Whitlock in our prayer time. We want to lift, lift up the, the Woods family, Sister Corey Woods and Sister Johnny Woods and their family. On Saturday, I mean on Friday, I'm sorry, on Friday at 10 o'clock at the Bethlehem Family Church, we're looking to finalize Brother Malvin White. So if you can, please, ma'am, please, sir, come out and support um, our family as we we lay to rest this our brother, Brother White. And lift up the woods and white sand, please. It is offering time. It's time to give the Lord tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you need an envelope, raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving to Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com. Our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. 
This is a book that I've been looking at since uh, 1997. Uh, if you want a copy, you can get a copy for a very, very small donation. Amen. Hallelujah. While we stand to be dismissed. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. Father, we thank you, Father God, that you have given us to the power. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you for him blessing us to be witnesses unto him. Bless us, Father God, that we will walk with you and that we, Father God, will be about your business. Bless us to be ready to give an answer to every person, always, of the hope that lies within us. Bless us, Father God, to always tell people about Jesus, his death, burial, and his resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. We pray, Father God, for the Whitlock family. We pray for Brother Kevin Whitlock. We ask you to bless Brother James Whitlock. We ask you to bless their spouses and their family members. Heal and touch their bodies, Father, as only you can. Bless them, Father God, that they will stand and tell of the goodness of Jesus Christ and how you are a healer and a great protector. We pray for the Woods and the White family. We ask you to touch their lives and give them peace and Give them comfort in this bereavement time. Continue to walk with them and bless their name. We pray for Sister Ann Paul. We ask you to heal her body and we ask you to touch her in the name of Jesus. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling. Him who is able to present us spotless before the only God. He who has blessed us. He who has dominion. He who has power. He who has given us deliverance power. We ask you to bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are in this